um, if not everyone, most of you are working from home or you're working sometimes in the office and sometimes at home or sometimes at a job site and sometimes, you know, kind of all over the place. So we we have some some tips in here for how to manage this uh, new environment. And then, like I said, Q&A, which we can also do throughout. So that's kind of our agenda for today. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about myself, my name is Jen McFarlane. I am a business consultant. Um, I focus on really helping people with operations and workflow. And when you help a small business, a lot of times it spills over into a lot of marketing. Um, my actual background is in uh, leadership and management. I have a master's degree and then I applied that on large scale tech projects at the city of Portland. And I did a lot of project design. So it was like strategically looking at what it is that we want to do and the best way to put that forward. Um, and I always came in uh, early and on time and on budget. So, uh, you know, time management, I guess, is kind of part of what I just do naturally. Um, I talk about a lot of these kinds of things on my podcast, um, which is the same name as my business, which is Women Conquer Business. Um, and then kind of the neat thing that I did with my husband was I was in Peace Corps in Kazakhstan, which in some ways has made COVID easier <laughs> because we've been stripped away of so many of our creature comforts. Um, and my husband and I already went through that for a couple of years in Peace Corps. So what I wanted to do here is kind of give you like a high level perspective of some of the top behavioral skills that we all need to have as leaders. And just to let you know that like time management is one of the one of the top behaviors that you can have um, that that will really help you move things forward. So if you're managing your time, it will help you with other things like presentations, communication, negotiation, managing your team, um, and then just overall leadership. So it's kind of one of those things that a lot of times people talk about time management in terms of, you know, this hot app you need to have or all of these different things, but really it's a pillar of just being a good leader. And that's why it's so important to talk about. So the top priorities or the top habits of a time management master, which would be uh, somebody who is, you know, managing their time effectively and getting stuff done, since that's really what this is all about, I think, if we're working, is getting stuff done. Um, the first one is having a well-organized filing system, and that's both paper and electronic. Um, and then avoiding procrastination. And procrastination actually goes into a couple of different uh, buckets. There's There are interruptions and there are distractions, and those are two different things. And one we may be able to manage better than the other, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, achieving a state of high productivity. So we can be productive, but it's really about keeping ourselves out of the busy work and into these higher states of productivity um, where you're able to get the most done. And believe it or not, I think there are some ways that we can do this from home. Um, and then the last thing is priorities and setting up different ways of looking at what you have in front of you and deciding what's really a priority and what's not. Um, and I really, I really love that part. I, I just... I just love setting priorities. It sounds like a really geeky thing, I know. Um, so one of the things that I found that was like super astounding is on average, we spend an awful lot of time uh, looking for things that we already have. And I don't know if you're like me, but you sometimes put something somewhere and you're like, now, now I know, <laughs> I know exactly where it is and then you can't find it. So how much time do you think most people spend looking for stuff that they already have. No guesses. It's cool. Six weeks. This is why we get so frustrated. We spend an average of six weeks of our lives in the course of a year looking for things that we already have. So one of the reasons why putting things in a place, having a system for putting things where they belong um, in our work life, and I think you can also apply this to your home life, is that you can actually save yourself like a month of your time looking for things that you already have. Um, I picked this picture of this desk because I just imagine that um, on work sites and different places, you know, desks can kind of look like this. And I think a lot of people do try to manage tasks and manage things at their desk. And what we're going to find out is that just doesn't really work very well. It's not very effective. So one of the one of the steps or the three key steps actually for clearing the clutter and increasing your focus is to really think about, you know, what your role is within the company and then put a little sweat equity in about how you're going to organize things and then you actually organize it. So here's an example of what this would look like. 
you want to think about how all of your tasks and everything that you're doing really relates to your role within your company or within your section. Um, and then come up with a really logical and simple system for putting everything together. And it has to be simple. I can't tell you how important simple is because as we all know, the more busy we get, if something is really complicated, then we're like, oh, I'll just get to it later. And then that's how we end up back with these desks that have post-it notes all over them and stuff where we can't really find it. So think about something super simple. Think about all of the different hats that you wear within your organization and then come up with some key folders that are both paper and in your email that really follow along with that. So in this example, it'd be like team management, account management, marketing and strategy. And you may have some things already set up if you're doing a lot of project management, as I assume Lucas does, but then you have these other things that you don't really know what to do with that might be outside of the project. So that would be kind of um, one of the ways that you might want to apply this. So then once you kind of set up your high level of the different hats that you wear and maybe some of the buckets where you'd put your documents, the next thing is to actually go through everything and start sorting through it and deciding what stays and what goes and then putting things in these various buckets. Now, it's important to realize that 80, 85% of everything that we keep, we're never going to look at again. So this is really a time to really clear out the stuff that you don't think is actually important because you haven't really touched it, you haven't really worked with it, and you may not ever do it again. This might be a time to you know, you have to retain certain files, certainly just for a record, but there are some things that you probably can let go of. So let go of the things that you don't really need anymore. And then as you're going through this process of identifying where things belong, you might come up with some different ways of actually organizing your files. So don't be afraid to go back and adjust the filing system so it makes the most sense. And again, this is not complicated. Don't overcomplicate things. Put things in places that make sense so that when you're in a super big rush and you have a lot of stress going on in your job, this is an easy way of organizing things. So then the third step is to actually organize it and put everything in its place, um, label things, make sure everything is, you know, do the back filing as much as you can, um, and then make the same organization in your email um, and in your electronic files. Um, this isn't just paper, but it kind of starts sometimes with paper if you have a really messy desk and then need to move on to something else. And here's the reason why I, you know, I've, <laughs> I've worked in a lot of offices and I can't tell you, and I've, I've been guilty of this myself at different times in my career, how many people try to hold everything in their head and have post-it notes everywhere. And what those things do is it's a real distraction. Like you'll be working and then you'll look at this post and you're like, oh, I, I really I really should do that. Even though it might not be the top priority. And if you're holding everything in your head, your brain is really great at a lot of things, but it can't really manage all of the tasks and it can't really manage your time as effectively. You have to clear some of this stuff out um, so that you're able to do that. Otherwise you end up like this this lady who's under this huge pile of papers, and I'm not sure, but I assume that she's kind of sobbing. It's gotta be kind of sad in there. Um, and what I like about this picture too, is there are all these binders behind her and like how many of us have like all of these filing systems that we never use. And then we end up with desks that are super messy. So that's one of the reasons why you have to create something that you'd actually use um, and be able to follow up. And it might take a little time, but again, you wanna avoid those six weeks of uh, <laughs> of hunting for things that you already have. So in, in the uh, context of, you know, COVID-19, it's really important to have a dedicated space as much as possible. If, if at all possible, it's great if you have a workspace with a door. And I know that a lot of people don't have that, um, but you should at least have one space where you can keep, keep your work and keep track of things. Um, and then it's really important to remember that busy isn't the same as productive. So when you're all out like searching for files and things that you already have, you're not really being productive. It's, it's not really helping you further anything. So the more that you can keep yourself off of tasks like looking for things that you already have and focused on things that are really gonna move the work forward, you'll find that that really reduces your stress and increases your focus and it also I don't know, it just keeps you out of that frustrated space. And that's what we're really trying to do right now. Um, because frankly, during COVID-19, we have enough out there <laughs> keeping us frustrated. <laughs> we don't need to be uh, searching for things we already have um, and stressing ourselves out more. 
Um, but probably the hottest tip on this whole slide is conducting a time audit so that you know how you're spending your time. And what a time audit really is, is it's a chance for you to um, go through your day and just make little notes of like how you're spending your time. And what you might find is you're not working on the things that are maybe important or your top priorities. And we're going to talk about priorities a little bit later, but it's really critical that you know how you're spending your time so that then you can begin to focus your energy on the things that are the most important. And I think that this is really, really a key thing to think about right now, because if you have kids and a busy family life and now you're working from home and you have more interruptions and honestly more distractions, um, Conducting a time audit and knowing how you're spending your time at work, you can begin to maybe optimize your day a little bit more. And uh, hold on, I like went spazzy on the slides. Um, you, can, you can really focus on how you're spending your time and optimize your day so that you're not feeling as stressed out when the distractions come. Because frankly, the distractions and the interruptions are going to come because we're working at home. So the next key area is about procrastination, which is putting off the things that we actually really need to get done. Um, and we'll do we'll do something else. So sometimes it could be like the first example, which is not not knowing where anything is and keeping yourself busy. And then it means that you're not working on that thing that you really need to be working on, that key priority. So what we're gonna talk about is one touch, one decision. So is this you? Because <laughs> I think this is all of us. So it's Monday morning. You open your computer. You've got so many emails that you're looking at. You start going through. You find the first couple are just not anything that you need to do. But then the third one is like, oh my gosh, I have 45 minutes of work that just landed in my inbox. I'm not going to deal with this right now. <laughs> so you close your email and you start working on all of the other things. And then at the end of the day, you swing back around and you read the email again and you realize that you have to do it. Um, but you don't have time right now because it's the end of the day. So you print it out and you put it on your desk. So we're already like kind of disrupting the first step, which is organizing the desk and keeping a clean desk what, by having a filing system. We're disrupting that by putting it by e by printing out the email and putting it on our desk. And then the same thing happens on Tuesday, you know, because you know that the emails are just going to keep proliferating. And that task that you have this 45 minutes um, is waiting for you. But then you also have all of these new emails coming in. So what we want to do is get to a system where this kind of thing, this routine of like revisiting things that are in your in your inbox, where we're not stewing about it, we're actually looking at it and not handling things multiple times. Because it's a lot easier to handle things multiple times and you're just procrastinating, you're just wasting time on that. Anytime you look at things over and over and over again and you haven't really decided what to do with it, you just know that you have to do something um, and you just aren't aren't taking any action on it. So what we really want to do is take you to a place where something comes in and you're making a decision about what needs to happen. And you know, I know that some of this seems like kind of fantasy land, but like it really does work because what you're trying to do is make a decision about whether or not you need to do something and then how long it's going to take and then making a decision about when you're actually going to do it. And you can actually schedule this time in your calendar. Um, you can do anything around like when you're actually going to do it. Well, what we're trying to do is get you off of that hamster wheel of looking at something over and over and over again and constantly trying to make a decision about uh, what you're what you're going to do. I think a lot of us, especially right now during COVID-19, feel a lot of decision fatigue. It means that we're constantly bombarded with new information and new things that we need to do. Um, in our work context, sometimes sometimes it's pretty easy. We just need to like take a simple action and figure out what's going to happen. So what I like about this um, simple chart is that, you know, do I really need to do anything with it? In the Monday morning example, the first two emails were useless and the answer is no, and they just go away. On the third email that you know it's going to take 45 minutes, you're like, well, yeah, no, I need to do something. I know it's going to take more than five minutes. So let's write down when I actually have to do it and then I'm going to file it until I have to do it. 
And there's, that's a really empowering action because you're actually taking something and you're taking a proactive decision around what's going to happen. And then you're carving time out of your day to actually take, take the action at the appropriate time instead of opening and closing the email over and over and over again, um, which puts you in the procrastination zone. You're actually going to do something as soon as it happens and then not worry about it until it's time to actually work on it. Um, this is hard to do. Um, these are just these are simple steps. Simple isn't always easy. Um, it's easy to talk about. It's a little bit harder to do. But this is a really key part of efficiency. How how good would it feel if you really only looked at your emails and at one time and you were able to make a decision about whether or not you're going to deal with it right away? Um, because if it takes less than five minutes, you might as well just do it and get it out. Get it get it out. <laughs> and take care of it. So, um, so that's nice. <laughs> what about COVID nineteen? Um, most of the time, it's you're not going to be you're not going to be affected by this most of the time. Uh, most of the time, you can make these decisions. Um, but there are some things to acknowledge about this time that we're living in, which is, you know, the remote team complexities. Like it's a lot harder sometimes to make these decisions because you know, you're not in the office space where maybe something that would take five minutes normally is going to take a little bit longer and you have to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, it's also harder to do like a work-life balance. I've noticed that even with my husband who um, he's, I find him like creeping over into his computer and working a little bit longer uh, than he used to uh, because the computer's always here, you know, and he's not used to working from home. So, there are a lot of things. And then it's like, why should I do this now? Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? So there's a lot going on right now around us. Um, but one of the ways that we can really um, stop staying busy all the time and really not feel as fatigued about all these decisions we have to make is like it comes in, you make a decision, you act on it. Um, and then it's like out of your head, it's out of out of your hands. Less than five minutes, you take care of it. More than five minutes, figure out the best time for doing it, and then you're not opening emails and stressing out at the end of the day. So um, I assume that when you see a high productivity state, um, <laughs> some of you might actually be laughing because you're working from home and you have kids and um, TV and laundry to do and maybe a couple home projects and you're thinking, how in the heck am I going to like avoid interruptions and distractions when everything happening in the world is screaming distraction <laughs> and we were kind of in a distracted world before like there's always been social media over the last few years there's been um you know 24-hour news cycle before COVID-19 um it's just now we're even more susceptible to it um and we're also from home and we're living in this place where every three minutes we are interrupted or distracted so an interruption is, you know, and I love this picture so much, I can't even say, is the dad who's trying to work and, you know, his cute, cute little kid comes up and wants, wants some help or wants to talk, you know, and so he's sitting there with, with this baby in his lap, you know, and, and those are the interruptions, right? These are things that happen from someone else. This can be your boss calling, this can be um, your baby coming over wanting to play, um, it can be your pet. <laughs> like I have a dog who is like fantastic and so excited all the time that uh, his parents are here and <laughs> we can't play with our dog all day. Um, and then there's distraction. And distraction is when we are doing it to ourselves. And so in some ways, interruptions we can't control, distractions we really can control. Um, so one of the things is, you know, really paying attention. And I think that this is also getting back to the time audit is really paying attention to how often we're interrupted and how long those interruptions or distractions are taking us away uh, from our day. So again, distractions are when we decide I'm going to text my friend, I'm going to go on social media, I'm going to read the news um, and I'm going to get all this done in five minutes or less. <laughs> and then I'm going to get back to my work. Um, and it was the University of California that found that, uh, you know, workers are interrupted or distracted every three minutes. And this was before COVID-19. So, you know, maybe we're distracted even more now. I would say we're probably interrupted more. Um, and if we don't really pay attention, we're definitely getting distracted more. 
so there are a few a few simple strategies for kind of reducing both interruptions and distractions. So you can minimize the effect of people interrupting you. Now, this is different, but <laughs> these are colleagues as opposed to our kids. So you can ask your colleagues to describe what it is, you know, within like a few seconds, just kind of, you know, give people a little bit of time to describe what's going on so that you can make a decision about whether or not this is something that you need to pursue immediately. Um, and then you can set up like regular catch ups. And these are like short meetings instead of long meetings. Um, because one of the other time management strategies that um, I'm not talking about today is around avoiding like ineffective meetings or unnecessary meetings. Um, so one of the ways that you can do this is have some regular meetings for catching up on a topic. And this will actually minimize the effect of people interrupting you because if you know that you're going to meet with somebody on a regular basis, you might be less likely to approach somebody else and they may be less likely to approach you. Um, and then it's, it, I love this book. It's called Deep Work. His name is Cal Newport. Um, and he really thinks, and I agree with him, that it's really important to block out some uninterrupted time for deep work. And that means working without, um, without social media, without um, email or phone open. And I know that like a lot of people, it's really maybe impossible with your jobs. This, these are things that working within the parameters of what you can and can't control, definitely. Um, but this is also the power of working in an office at home with a door is if your kids are old enough, you can maybe set aside like time that you can work without interruptions. I know that this gets a lot more challenging with little kids for sure. Um, and these are all best case scenarios, but really a deep work session can be as little as 20 minutes um, that you can get a lot done in 20 minutes without any, if you eliminate all the distractions and as many interruptions as possible. So in a way to reduce distractions, again, which are the things that you actually can control, which are those rabbit holes you go down all the time if you start reading the news or social media or texting, um, is capture your thoughts. So acknowledge that you have something that you're thinking about that's taking you away from the priority you're working on and jot it down. So keep a list of all the things that you have to do um, as they pop into your head. So if you're like me, sometimes when I want to procrastinate, I'll do laundry or things that I would never enjoy doing <laughs> so that I can be doing something, um, but it's actually taking me away from the most important things. So I would never say like, don't do it <laughs> ever, <laughs> but I would say there's a time and a place for doing things. So when you realize um, that you need to do your laundry or you realize that you need to, you know, replace the batteries in your, you know, smoke detector or something like that, like you may not have to do it right now, but if you acknowledge it and write it down, then you can set up, set up a more effective time and place for doing it. Um, and then again, talking about the clean desk policy, um, all of those papers that you have um, around your desk and notes and things, those are really just distractions that will take you away from what's most important for you to work on. Um, so the cleaner you can keep your desk, the better. So jot it down and then find a place to put it, you know, put it in your filing system, put it in your calendar when you want to handle some of these distractions that you're coming up with. Um, so, you know, here we go. Now it's, that's nice. <laughs> what about COVID-19? <laughs> so again, it's like you have way more distractions and interruptions. Like I said, you know, it's really easy to, uh, do home repairs, um, or laundry instead of working. Um, so the more that you can be mindful of that and pay attention to that, the better off you are because you're not going to be like constantly going out there. Again, it's about knowing how you're spending your time and then, you know, kind of reining yourself in a little bit if you find that you'd rather be waxing the floor than doing something that is really key to your to your work. Um, and then, you know, eliminating as many distractions as you can. So again, these are the things that you can control. You might not be able to control, um, you know, your kids wanting to spend some quality time with you. It's got to be hard with all of the, you know, the school online and you know, can't they can't go hang out with all their friends all the time as much as they want, you know, but there are some things that you are in control of. So, you know, email, texting, some of those extra things that kind of, 
you know, infiltrate our day. You know, somebody texts you and says, did you see this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes it's better if you just aren't looking at your phone, if you can avoid it. Um, or if you say, no, I haven't had a chance. I'll look at that later <laughs> and not actually follow up and do it. The other thing that's really important is taking breaks. And people don't often talk about this as a really important time management strategy, but sometimes if we just work and work and work, we're actually tiring ourselves out and we're, we're, we're losing the effectiveness of our work. So this is never gonna be about punishing yourself and saying, well, I can't ever be distracted. No, it's actually about honoring the fact that you need to do other things. And that's where these distractions come in. It's about saying, well, no, I'm going to take a break and I can handle some of those distractions. I can go on social media. Um, I can, I can, you know, check out my new Spotify list or whatever um, if I take a break. Um, and then one of the things I had mentioned, the deep work. Um, so 20 minutes of uninterrupted time with five minute breaks. Those are actually called Pomodoro sessions. Um, and you can look that up. There's actually something called tomatotimer.com. So the Pomodoro sessions were invented by uh, a man from Italy uh, like a few hundred years ago. Um, and you can just set aside like 20 minutes. And it's, believe it or not, it's really hard in the beginning to do it. Um, people say they want to do like six Pomodoro sessions a day. That's actually impossible. We're not really used to... 20 minute blocks of time that are completely uninterrupted, meaning you're not surfing the web, you're not doing any, you're not checking email, you're not looking at your phone, you're just working on one high priority task. And then after 20 minutes, an alarm goes off and you go take a little break. Um, but if you have something really big to do, sometimes these sessions can really like save your bacon because you can get so much done in 20 minutes that you didn't know if you limit all of the rest of the distractions that are going on um, around your house or in your workplace. Um, and then, and and again, a Pomodoro session, it kind of does require an office with a door or a space, a space with a door so that you can really focus. Um, and then avoid multitasking. So this is, this is kind of the crazy thing. They've done studies on multitasking and they found that only 2.5% of people can actually multitask. What happens to most of us on our brain is it's like a light switch. So if you're focusing on one thing and then you're like, oh, I'm going to go do that. It's like your brain has to shut down, turn back on, focus on that thing. And then anytime you switch, it's taking that same light switch action, you know, so it's like turning off and turning back on. So what that means is you're actually losing more time by trying to do everything than if you just focus on one task at a time because it's really how our brains are working. You know, uh, the problem is we spend so much time in this distracted world, um, we don't, our brains may not know how to handle it anymore. So it kind of takes a little time to like work that muscle around not multitasking all of the time, um, but it'll pay off. And then I've already talked about the office with the door. Um, and then, you know, if you can schedule your most important work while the kids are busy. Um, you know, I know that not everybody has a lot of control over their day, but control the things that you can and try to schedule some time um, that you can get some work done. I know some people are doing shifts where, um, you know, they're working more in the morning and then their husband's working more in the evening. That works if you have two parents at home. If you don't have two parents at home, um, sometimes it's about making a deal. <laughs> with your kids if you can. Um, and then I have I have colleagues who are single parents with kids under five and um, they're really just getting in little bits of time in um, so that they can still spend some time with their kids and be a good parent. And I think that's the toughest situation of all. Um, but within all of the parameters, it's about finding a time um, that will work um, where you can still um, manage the, the parent life alongside um, the office responsibilities that you have. And and then really it is about doing, you know, stop doing what doesn't work. Um, pay attention to what you're doing and work on the things, improving the things that really do work. Um, so uh, we're getting into the last of the last top effective time management strategy. This is actually my favorite, um, which is prioritizing tasks. And it's like unlocking 
like it's like solving the puzzle <laughs> when you realize that all of your tasks really fall into four categories. So this is called the Eisenhower matrix. You can, and I think Covey, Franklin Covey has something similar. You can find different things like this, but President Eisenhower was the one who said, everything I need to do falls into four different categories. Um, and so it's important, not important, urgent, and not urgent. So what we really wanna do is focus on really only half, <laughs> half of the matrix um, and the other half we really don't want to. So what we have are important and urgent tasks are the things that we need to do first. These are things that have to happen today. They're really important. They really are gonna move things forward. Um, and then we wanna work on things that are important, but not urgent. And as you'll find, I think that this is the one where all the magic happens. Um, but because it's not as urgent, um, sometimes this is the one that people work on the, le the least, which is the things that you need to schedule that maybe aren't, aren't urgent in the minute. Um, and then there's the not important, but urgent things. These are the things that actually you need to delegate. Um, these are, I have flames in here because this is where people feel like their hair is on fire <laughs> and they're running around, um, but that's really not that important. Like, and we can, and most people spend most of their time um, on things that they need, they could delegate or things that really aren't as important. It's just, they feel super duper urgent. Um, and some of it you can control and some of it you can't. And then the, the, the fourth area is, are the things that you just need to avoid entirely. Um, and some of it we've talked about already. These are things that are not important and not urgent. These are where the distractions go, um, where you kind of find yourself working on things that aren't really important, or you're texting your friends or doing social media, the things you really um, don't need to be during, doing during work times anyway. Um, interruptions, again, we can't do a lot about, but the, the distractions we really can. So um, we're gonna kind of talk about what each of these things mean and then uh, how maybe to not spend all of our time in the delegation zone. So the most important place is, like I said, the things that you need to do first. So these are discerning out what's actually urgent and important and taking care of those things first. So these are like all of the demands from your superiors and your customers. These are um, resolving problems that are, are high, high priority issues that need to be taken care of today, um, handling crises and complaints. Um, but again, that's different from things that maybe aren't as important. So this is about things that are like really helping you push work forward, um, staff issues, reports, those types of things. Those are important and urgent. And those are like the first things that you're gonna wanna be taking care of in your day. What would be great is if you looked at all of the tasks that you have to do and you put them in these various buckets ahead of time. So the next one is really where most people should be spending a lot more time and they don't. This is where the magic happens. And I'm not just saying this is someone who's been a project manager, although I think that that probably has something to do with it. Um, this is about where you really chart the course for what's gonna happen next. This is where change happens. This is where new initiatives get planned. This is where you think about the systems and processes because a lot of what we've been talking about is really systematizing your work, coming up with a way that you can process through work that makes a lot of sense so that you can save some time in your day. But this actually expands out to bigger parts of your work life, um, maybe your personal life where you're really thinking things through, modeling things, building relationships, talking to people. This is where the magic happens that actually makes everything else easier. But it's also the place where most people spend the least amount of their time. Um, because a lot, you know, sometimes probably half of you fell asleep when I said plan. You know, a lot of people don't like planning. Um, but it actually is where things pay off in the end. So, so this is where people spend most of their time. Um, and it's because a lot of these things just seem important um, because they're urgent, <laughs> but they're maybe actually not important. And either they don't really need to be done at all, or it's something that somebody else can take care of. So a lot of it is um, if we look back and think about, 
you know, the things that are important but not as urgent. It's about like getting rid of things like the pointless routines and activities. So if you're systematizing and spending the time on scheduling and planning things out and looking at systems and processes, then you're not going to have as many pointless routines and activities <laughs> that are keeping you working on things that really aren't as urgent. So a lot of it is about really thinking things through so that you can discern whether or not something is actually urgent or it just feels urgent, whether or not something is important or if it just feels important. So a lot of people like to, <laughs> one of the worst things about email is people just like to forward things and they're really not important. So looking at the email, like we talked about earlier and deciding whether or not it's a trivial request or if it's something you actually have to do. Um, a lot of these things are where we spend a lot of our time. Most people stay here all day long and we feel like we've gotten a lot done until we look at, you know, maybe the status of some projects or we look at some of our bigger goals and visions and then we're like, oh man, <laughs> what was I doing today? I didn't get anything done. So one of the ways of, that's what I love about this Eisenhower matrix is that you can then look at these things and be like, man, I don't want to spend all day here. Now, there's some things on here that you might not be able to avoid. So, um, and I almost took this off, the boss's whims or tantrums, but I think that it's important to acknowledge that sometimes, sometimes we can't control everything. Um, and sometimes we have to work on things that we don't really think are as important, um, but they're important to somebody else. But I think the key is like within our own span of control, <laughs> you know, we can be better communicators. We can be, um, we can break through some of the routines that don't make a lot of sense um, and we can discern some things, but you're not ever gonna be completely out of the unimportant but urgent bucket. Um, it's just to avoid being there all day long. Um, and then the last one are the things that we can really avoid. Um, and we're never going to avoid all of it, but we can make some decisions that would help our time management a little bit better, which is um, things that are like, you know, forwarding silly emails to people, sending text messages, social media during our work time, uh, gossiping with other people. And then like the comfort activities like surfing the net, like that makes us feel good until we end up having to work late. So we wanna be able to, to avoid some of those things um, throughout our day <laughs> so that we are um, working on the things that are the most important, which are usually the things we have to handle first and then scheduling out time for actual planning and optimizing our work. Um, not just working on the projects of, for other people, but also optimizing what it is that we need to do to make things easier. So that would be like the filing system we talked about a minute ago. Um, but yeah, we really wanna stay out of um, the gossip and social media and all of that stuff because it really pulls us away from our really key priorities. Um, and then at the end of the day, again, you think I didn't really get anything done. And there's nothing more difficult than getting to the end of the day and feeling like you haven't really gotten anything done. So, it's important to then to, to realize that, you know, these key priorities and how we categorize things, these can also show up in, you know, your Outlook calendar. You can, you can label things and you can put things in your calendar for like planning time that don't actually block out your time. So if you actually have a meeting that comes in, it's not going to show as busy, um, but you can put tasks in and kind of block out, you know, how you think you might be able to structure your day. Um, knowing that other people may come along and, and priorities change. Um, but you certainly can put, and this is just an example of like how to have A, A B, C priorities um, and then non-priority tasks because we all have non-priority tasks that we have to take care of. Um, and then you can kind of look at how you have everything set up here and decide like, you know, there are a lot of things here that really aren't a high priority. Maybe I should say no a little bit more often on the things that I have the ability to say no on. Um, but really setting out setting out a way, a plan of how you want to get through work um, without blocking out your time so that you can't meet with your supervisor. <laughs> so it's important that you don't mark them as busy. This can really help you make sure that you kind of stay on top of your productivity um, and really save yourself a lot of time um, because you know, you're know you not going to have post-its all over your desk. The post-its are going in here so that you can actually get it done when it needs to be done. And I know, I know, here we are. That's nice, but what about COVID-19? <laughs> so setting priorities is hard. I'm not gonna say that that it's not hard. It is, 
but nobody can do everything. I love this picture off to the side, like to do everything, but no one can do it all. So what we're really trying to do is like sift through the things that are coming in. And we all know that we're getting a lot of things coming in. So everything isn't, isn't an emergency. Some things really aren't as important or as urgent. And there are some things that we actually can't avoid. Um, and, <laughs> and understand that, you know, there are a lot of heightened emotions out there right now. So, what we're really trying to do is prevent overscheduling and help people um, understand what you're working on so that you can increase your communication around some things. Um, and then realizing that, you know, your emergency might not be somebody else's and that somebody might be pushing work to you that you really don't have to work on. But if we spend more time where we're not hunting for things that we can't find <laughs> and we're working on the things that we really need to be working on, um, you know, we're really starting to put the pieces together where we're getting rid of um, the mental clutter and we're creating a, a system for ourselves where we're able to really optimize our work in a dedicated workspace, ideally with a door. But I know a lot of people working from home really don't have the ability to um, have like a complete desk with a door. Um, but minimizing the distractions and then acknowledging that you can't control all of the interruptions. Um, if you optimize other areas of your life, then the interruptions start to fall off and you just kind of are able to acknowledge them and, and take care of it. It's when other areas are really stressful. Like if you're spending a lot of time looking for things, if you're spending a lot of time um, unclear about what needs to happen, then those interruptions really can be hot buttons for us. So what we want to do is create systems in, in our work and home life that we're able to handle the interruptions a little bit better because um, we're probably going to be we're working from home for quite some time. And then make it so that you're touching things as few times as possible. You might not be able to do the one touch, one decision, but really acknowledge how many times you're opening the same email and try to try to limit it. You know, if you can't do one time, try to do, you know, maybe two or three. Um, and then prioritize your work as it comes in. And it takes a little bit of practice, but it is it is a really freeing thing when you can at least say, wow, I'm working on something that really isn't that important. <laughs> Maybe there's something else I could be working on. Um, and don't be afraid of spending some time planning on things and, and putting together some strategies to really systematize your work to make it a little easier. So now we can just open it up to some Q and A because I didn't see anything come in. I've just seen comments, but does anybody have any questions or maybe things that they would like to share with Jen? I don't have a question, but I am really excited about trying this um, Pomodoro, Pomodoro sessions yeah. um, just because like when I'm scheduling time out for myself to work, I feel like I need to schedule like a whole hour or two hours or it's not worth it, but that's really unrealistic right now with being home with four kids. So mm -hmm. if I can even just set a timer and tell the kids like, I'm only gonna be gone for 25 minutes, um, you know, and go shut the door somewhere. Maybe if I put it into practice, it will help me feel a little less um, <laughs> overwhelmed and feel like I'm accomplishing little bits throughout the day. So I thought that's really interesting. Yeah, that's great. And um, the website that does it for you um, is tomato-timer.com. And that's really just a timer so that it'll, when you decide to do a, a session, then it'll ding and let you know that you're done. Um, and it really, it's really most effective if you're able to like get your phone away from you, all the other things that um, that you tend to do when you're trying to focus. This is about, and there's there's actually like, apps like freedom that you can put on your phone and on your computer that like make it so that you can't even open Google <laughs> if you don't need it. So, um, so yeah, the more that you can eliminate all distractions, 20 minutes, you can get a lot done for sure. Yeah. And I'll share, um, I'll share that um, when I send this out to everybody and, and Jen, you actually, there was a book that you recommended too. Could you re, re um, Remind me of that title and the author on that. Yeah, so there are two books. His name is Cal Newport. I'm looking at my shelf right now. Um, so C-A-L-N-E-W-P-O-R-T. And he wrote two books. One is Deep Work, and that's the one I referred to. And the other one is Digital Minimalism. And 
they're both geared around um, productivity, um, the effect that all of this, all of the digital has like on our brain and our ability to concentrate. Deep work is the one that really goes into um, the importance of these dedicated times to really get some work done. And then if you just look him up, he's actually written a lot of blog posts about it as well. So you don't even have to buy the book to really learn fundamentally um, why deep work is important. Cool, thank you. <laughs> we'll share that too with our folks. Cool. And I do know, I mean, I, for me, I, I mean, I had never seen the um, Eisenhower matrix and, and Jessica was commenting in the chat that sh this is how her planner is organized. And I like it because it's very simplistic. That's what I was going to mention is I've been using the Eisenhower matrix for about two years now and it's wonderful. So if anybody on the team has questions, I can share with you what my planner looks like. Um, I love the Eisenhower matrix. I love it. That's so great. So what which planner are you using? I actually created it. So um, I at the company where I was at uh, for a while previously, management team was really big on this urgent important not urgent important matrix and they i'm a graphic designer so they were like hey can you design something for the company um so it's something that i created with a couple of different planners in mind so it's my own i can't really direct you to a website because it doesn't Rad. exist anywhere it's that's fun fantastic yeah no that's great um i'm so glad it works for you um I'm still in, I'm still incorporating it into my own work. Um, but no, that's great. I love it. Are there any other questions or? I guess not, but I'm thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jen, for, for today. Like I said, and I think yeah. other people have commented um, some great um, advice some great tools, and I will certainly share this um, not only with those attended today, but also um, for um, the rest of our staff. Um, and Jessica, maybe we might even tap into what you have uh, developed and, and look at and see what might be an interest for some of our folks as well. Um, and thank you, you guys, for attending. You know, I know Fridays uh, for some of us, it's our day off because some of us work four tens, but others of, others of us, it's a day that we still work. But I appreciate you taking your, your time out today and attending. And um, you know, you guys have a great weekend, everyone. OK, thank you. And I, the awesome. recording, I'll share the recording as well. I started it a little late, so I apologize. I had a blonde moment, um, but I will get that out to everybody as well, too. Awesome. It was nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. thank you. Have a good weekend. You have a good weekend. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I just saw the comment, if your cat brings a half-dead bird under your desk, that's amazing. <laughs>